Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down Irredeemable Volume 4. This volume starts out a little bit slow. We have an origin story for Hornet, as well as Caden. Then we have a little bit of a filler, bete noir kind of issue. But the final two issues in this volume really dial up the action, and it ends with an epic confrontation between the Paradigm and Plutonian, which you will not want to miss. So you will all be pretty hyped by the end of this volume. I just want to give everyone a heads up. I am going on a vacation. One of my friends is getting married in Scotland, so I am going to Europe. I'm going to Scotland, and then I'm going to go to London and Paris. So it's my first time in Europe. I'm pretty excited. Uh, but it means I will not be able to post a video for the next two weeks. So I will be on a two-week hiatus. But then I will be back after that with Irredeemable Volume 5. So just a heads up on that for everyone. All right, let's dive into the story for Irredeemable Volume 4. Irredeemable Volume 4, written by Mark Wade, art by Diego Barreto. Irredeemable Special Number 1. In this issue, we will learn the origin of some characters. First is the Hornet. You all remember the Hornet, right? He was the Paradigm member that died in the beginning of issue one. Well, he is going to be somewhat important in future volumes, even though he is dead, so it is worth learning about him. Five years ago, the Hornet, whose real name we learn is Jim, was talking to his wife, Donna. At the time, he was not a superhero. He was just a normal cop trying to make a difference. As a police officer, he couldn't handle all of the crime in his city, so, with the support of his wife and selling some of her family's stock, Jim took that money and he invested in some superhero gear like a car, charged weapons, bulletproof armor, etc. He is going to fight crime as the Hornet and be a real street-level hero. At the time when he was first setting out to do this, and he was a little nervous about it, his wife gave him a pep talk and she told her husband, No one's ever done this before, Jim. No one's ever set out to be a real-life superhero. You're going to be the first. The only thing the whole world will be talking about tomorrow is you. You're going to be a hero, a legend. The next day, when Jim set out to be this superhero, that is the day the Plutonian first showed himself to the world, and Plutonian completely overshadowed the Hornet. A year after that, the Hornet is still continuing his superhero career, even though he is being overshadowed by some others. He is in someone's home, and he is trying to disarm a bomb that is strapped to a child. The Hornet is trying to keep the child calm, and Plutonian is outside the home, battling the kidnappers. The Hornet is making progress on disarming the bomb, and then Plutonian crashes through the ceiling, and Plutonian, he rips the bomb off the child's body and chucks the bomb high into the air out of the building, and the bomb explodes safely in midair away from everyone and everything. Plutonian, he did kind of save the day and save the boy. He tells the child, it's all right, son, you're safe now. Afterwards, Hornet, talking to Plutonian, is a little annoyed, and he tells him, I had this, thanks. If I'd wanted it handled Plutonian style, I'd have brought a wrecking ball. Hornet, expecting Plutonian to be a jerk, is instead surprised at how Boy Scout of an answer Plutonian gives in response. Plutonian says, You're right, I handled that poorly. I didn't scout the area before I started swinging. I could learn from you. Plutonian asks to speak to Hornet on the roof more privately. On the roof, Hornet expresses his frustration to Plutonian more privately. He says, I have a right to be pissed. This is what, the third time you and I have crossed paths? And it always ends with you signing autographs while I look like a moron. Plutonian answers, You're hardly a moron. You're an inspiration. I'm in awe. You're a sniper rifle and I'm a blunderbuss. There's a precision to what you do that I genuinely admire. So, I have an offer to make. We're all relatively new, right? You, me, and that cubit fellow, Caden, out of Tokyo. 
I think we should try and get together just once and see how it goes, but talk, share our experiences, see if we can get even better at this. Hornet, he really expected to hate Plutonian, but Plutonian ended up being really nice to him, and Plutonian, he brought the various heroes together and they formed the Paradigm. Knowing what we now know about Plutonian, we must wonder how much of what Plutonian said to Hornet then was an act, or did he genuinely feel that way in the past? We jump ahead a few more years now, just before the events of Issue 1, where Plutonian killed Hornet and his family. So we jump back moments before that happened. Hornet, he is driving home frantically to get to his family. On the drive, Hornet, he flips a switch in his car, and we see something that says, Vespa 1 activated. Hornet, as he is driving, mutters to himself, I'll never see you pay for how you've betrayed us, Plutonian, but you will pay. The Vespa will make you pay. What are the Vespa Hornet is referring to? Well, that is just a little tidbit of something to be revealed later in the story. The next origin story is that of Kaden. We jump back five years ago to Japan. Kaden was going by her civilian name, Keiko, then. On this particular day back then, it was the celebration of something in Japan called Coming of Age Day. It is a celebration held annually on the second Monday of January. It is held in order to congratulate and encourage all those who have reached or will reach the age of maturity, 20 years old, between April 2nd of the previous year and April 1st of the current year. And the celebration is a kind of welcoming to adulthood for these people. Keiko was 20 years old this year, so she is getting ready to celebrate with her friends in some traditional Japanese clothes. Keiko's mother tells her friends to run off, and Keiko will meet them later. Keiko is angry with her mom, says that she doesn't want to do this. Keiko's mom tells her, though, I will brook no argument, child. We've discussed this. For generations, the women of our bloodline have wielded the ghost story as a samurai wields his sword. The power of the Kaden is our heritage, and it is to be accepted for the greater good. Keiko argues with her mom some more. She says she won't do it, and that the line ends with her. But Kiko's mom slaps her and tells her, I will not tolerate your insolence. This is a gift that I passed to you as it was passed to me. You will not refuse it. Keiko is in a particular room in their home there, and her mother tells her daughter, This door will be locked, and you cannot leave this room until the ceremony is completed. So there is no use procrastinating. Keiko is in the room alone now, and she can't believe her mom slapped her and is locking her in this room. She hates her mom right now. Keiko realizes that she is not getting out of here until she does what her mom wants her to do, so she begins the ceremony that she must get over with. Over a candle, Keiko says, All right then, let's get this over with. The tale of the Bakeneko. An old couple lived in poverty, taxed into ruin by the emperor. They could not bear children, so they treated their cat as their child. One day, the cat transformed into a beautiful woman and vowed to slay the emperor and free the land, but her shape-shifting brought with it an air of dread and fear. All of a sudden, the Bakeneko appeared before her. Bakeneko is like a giant mystical purple cat spirit, and the Bakeneko talks with Keiko. The Bakeneko says, Did your mother not warn you, dear? The gift of the Kaden means that the ghost stories you tell become real, and who am I to thank for disturbing my rest? Keiko responds, I, Keiko, daughter of Sukuri, and I have come to tame you. The cat and Keiko talk some more, and the cat eventually tells her, I will give you the same choice I have given all the women of your family. Allow me to take either your place in the world of the living or that of your mother's. Your mother has always been bitter toward you. Wouldn't you want a mother who knows the importance of friends? Or romantic relationships you may have? You must choose, Keiko. 
as all those before you have. This is your test. Do I replace you or your mother? Choose. No dawdling child, do you hear me? Keiko, she chooses herself. And the bake neko then disappears. Keiko's mother, who is listening in the other room, runs in. She yells, no, you were to choose me. That is how it works. That is what I have taught you to do. Oh, oh, daughter, all your life I have tormented you into this moment. I have missed so many chances to love you, but I could not bear the thought of losing you to the bake neko. But why did he replace neither of us? All of Keiko's life, her mother was purposely a little bit cold and mean to her. She did this in an effort to get Keiko to choose her, sacrifice her. But instead, Keiko did the selfless thing, and she chose herself to sacrifice. Keiko responds to her mother, The big Neko didn't replace me because I passed his test. The spirit would have demanded entry into the world of the living, only had I... had I... Failed. Mother, you failed, didn't you? It seems like Keiko's mother sacrificed her own mother when the time came, back in the day for her many, many years ago. Keiko's mother tells her now, though, we will not speak of that. You have an uncanny streak of selflessness in you, Keiko. Never lose that. Someday it may be your love that saves the world. Issue 13 Issue 13 is a little bit filler, to be honest. It provides some recap for new readers, but we do learn some new info and meet some previous members of the paradigm. Last volume, Volume 3, ended with Plutonian going into hiding and spending some time with Samsara, who is really controlled by Modius. The paradigm, meanwhile, were arrested by the U.S. military, with the exception of Carrie, who was battling the demon Orion and got pulled into Orion's dimension. Apparently, Bette Noir, she was able to escape from the U.S. Army. So this issue picks up with her. We are following her as she goes and searches for her dad. Her dad is now living in the park and is homeless because his home is destroyed in one of Plutonian's many battles and rages. Bette Noir, talking to her dad in the park, needs to unload some of her guilt on him. She tells her dad what has been happening. She explains some of the events on the day that Plutonian wiped out Sky City when he first went crazy. On that day, Bette Noir and Volt were on a mission, apprehending some villains, and news came out that Sky City was destroyed. Bette Noir and Volt returned to Paradigm Headquarters, and at Paradigm Headquarters, Cubit and the others were panicking, trying to figure out what happened to Sky City. They don't know where Plutonian is, but they do not suspect him at this point. Two members of the Paradigm, who we've honestly just been ignoring up to this point, are Metal Man and Citadel, and they were at an elementary school giving a just say no to drug speech to kids there, when all of a sudden, Metal Man sent a code black message saying, he took my legs! I assume Plutonian took his legs. <laughs> Cubit asks the other Paradigm hero who we've not heard of to this point, named Gazer, to use his abilities to psychically link with the other hero known as Citadel. Gazer possesses telepathic powers capable of extending his sight and hearing by linking with the minds of others. So when Gazer connects with this Citadel, we see that Citadel is being burned alive and is screaming, and Citadel yells, Cubit, don't let me die! Cubit asks Gazer to put Citadel's last neural imprint on their computer screen for analysis. And when they do so, they see images of Plutonian going evil and burning and killing people. This was the very first moment the Paradigm first saw Plutonian gone mad. It was such a bizarre sight for them all to see that they assumed that maybe Plutonian was hypnotized or someone was posing as him. The Paradigm headed over to the elementary school to save the kids there and potentially stop evil Plutonian from killing others. They arrive at the school and they all begin battling Plutonian a bit. Gazer, he got killed in the battle. 
and a few other people got injured there as well. Bette Noir, she told Plutonian there that day, Tony, don't. Pull yourself back. Don't do this. The candle. Don't make me use the candle. Plutonian, he almost killed Bette Noir with his eye beams, but Gilgamo saved his wife's life and tackled her out of the way. And Plutonian then flew off. Now, Bette Noir, she feels bad because she could have stopped all of this then. She could have told the paradigm, oh, I have this magical candle that we can use to kill the Plutonian, but she didn't. She stayed silent. Why did she stay silent? Why didn't she do something? Maybe she was scared. Maybe she was weak. Maybe she was embarrassed by her affair. Either way, she really regrets her actions. Back to the current day, Bette Noir has unloaded all of this information on her dad and how she feels this is all her fault for staying silent. Her dad is not happy. Millions have died, including some of their family that was living in Singapore. Bette Noir asks for her dad's forgiveness and he says to his daughter, not right now. He tells her, you want me to tell you it was okay to be afraid? I can't, but look around, Bette. At least there's nothing left to be afraid of. Millions are dead. Your husband and your teammates are in prison. The world is on the brink. So I'll ask you this. What are you going to do about it now? Elsewhere. We see one of the cubit rogue Modius robot androids drinking tea. And he has Scylla and Encanta held hostage with him. Issue 14. All right, now we are kind of continuing on with the real bulk of the story. On the street, we see a hitman pointing a gun at another man who is on his knees. The hitman looks like he is going to kill that other man. But before the hitman can pull the trigger though, both men see writing on each other's foreheads. It is the same words that summoned the demon Orion in the previous volume. Both men read the words and then both men die as Orion and Carrie get summoned through their bodies. Orion then stretches and tells Carrie, Mmm, welcome home! Carrie, disgusted with all the blood and guts around them and their mode of transportation, asks, How do we get here? And Orion answers, I should have warned you. Only way to get from my dimension to yours is some poor human sacrifice has to read the alien word. Carrie asks, what? People died for us to get here? Orion replies, oh, boo-hoo. I knew you'd be all prissy about it if I went random. So I picked a hitman and a pedophile sex offender. They came to noble ends for a greater good, yeah? Carrie and Orion, apparently when they were fighting in the other dimension there, struck a bargain. They both really want to kill Plutonian. So Orion is going to help Carrie get revenge on Plutonian for killing his brother, and Carrie will let Orion live. The two of them now begin their rocky partnership and get to work. Elsewhere, over to where the U.S. Army is keeping the Paradigm members prisoner. Each of the prisoners are in a cell kind of tailored to them so they can't escape. We see Cubit. He really has nothing to work with in his cell to get out of here. Volt's cell is tailored to his abilities. The door and walls are covered in steel wool. One stray spark from Volt from his abilities, and he will burn up like tinder. Kaden, meanwhile, in her cell, she is strapped down and she can't move or use her voice at all. Gilgamos is in another cell all by himself, too. Gilgamos in his cell remembers a time over a thousand years ago where he shared a cell with Alexander the Great. The two of them ate rats and used the bones of the rats to pick the lock of the prison cell they were in and escape from it. Now Gilgamos, now in the current day, has no rats this time. So instead, he painfully rips off his second wing and uses the bones from that wing to pick the lock and get out of here. Later on, Bette Noir, now motivated after talking with her father to finally do something and act and be courageous, she returns to the army prison cells and she frees the rest of her comrades. When Bette, Cubit, Volt, and Caden go to look for Gilgamos, 
They see in horror what Gilgamos did to escape, with his bloody wing on this cell room floor. Bet Noir tells the others, If Gilgamos left here without even bothering to spring his teammates, then there's only one thing on his mind. I can guess where he's gone. Let's turn up your clothes and teleportals and go find him before it's too late. They all teleport over to Bet Noir and Gilgamos' home. The place looks ransacked. Bet Noir explains that the magical candle wax that she stole that can hurt Plutonian, well, she made it into a bullet that she can fire with her special gun. Gilgamos then walks into the room, and he found and is holding that magic bullet. Bet Noir tells Gilgamos, Gil, Gil, listen to me. You're not thinking straight. I know what you want. You want to get revenge on Tony, but you are in no condition to face him down. Not even with that. Gilgamos says, I'm aware. That's why I'm not going it alone. Gilgamos has teamed up with Carrie and the demon Orion. Orion asks Bet Noir, Come with us, Bet. You're the marksman. You're the one with the gun. You want forgiveness? You want redemption for helping to set the world on fire? Then take the shot. Bet Noir, she agrees. Carrie, Orion, Gilgamos, and Bet Noir then take their leave, and they fly off courtesy of Carrie. Caden, Bolt, and Cubit were left behind. Cubit, he screams out a warning, he says. Bet, no, that's Orion. We never trust Orion. Carrie, Gil, stop. He's every bit as bad as Tony. He's got something up his sleeve. I, I know he does. Don't do this. He'll kill you all. Carrie with Orion, Gilgamos, and Bet Noir travel to the Grand Canyon, as it is pretty secluded. Carrie, he shoots a massive beam of energy into the air that can be seen from space. Carrie knows Plutonian will hear and see it and come to them ready to fight. As they are all waiting for Plutonian to arrive and for a battle to begin, that is when they see Samsara standing there, their fallen teammate. Caden asks, Sam, is that really you? Samsara, who is really being controlled by Modius, answers, In the flesh. Nice plan. You really think you could sneak around behind someone who can hear and see everything on the planet? He's coming for you. And he's not happy. Plutonian, he then flies down, looking very pissed off indeed. Issue 15 Plutonian flying down tackles Carrie, and they explode through the ground, and then they start battling in the crust of the earth, creating a ginormous hole wherever they go through. On the surface, Orion, Gilgamos, and Bet Noir begin to scheme their plan. Bet Noir is planning on taking the kill shot. She has her special gun ready, and it has the magic candle wax bullet inside ready to go. Modius, Samsara, he just stands back and watches. Cubit, Volt, and Caden, they teleport over to the Grand Canyon as well, to the location of all the fighting with the others. Cubit, he looks at some readings on his watch, and he says that Plutonian and Carrie are idiots. Their fighting led them to go right through a major fault line in the Earth, and they've triggered a 9.8 earthquake, and it's growing. Bet Noir, she looks at Sam Sarah and is weirded out. She asks him, You were in the grave, Sam. Emodia Sam Sarah answers, I resurrect. That's my power, remember? Bet Noir, she just feels like Something isn't right with Samsara. Plutonian and Carrie, they burst out of the earth into the air. Gilgamos and Orion, they join the fighting and they tackle Plutonian. And they're all triple teaming him, feeding him punches and keeping him busy. On the ground, there is debate on what to do. Bet Noir is readying the kill shot with the magic bullet. Cubit, he doesn't think that they should kill Plutonian though. He doesn't trust Orion. He says, Dear God, why am I the only one here who'd rather be dealing with a man we can still reach? Referring to Plutonian, he still thinks they can reach Plutonian. Rather than an alien marauder 
who's obviously playing us so he can take out all opposition. He's referring to Orion when he says that. Volt argues that they can handle Orion. Modius Samsara, he pulls Volt aside and tells him that he brought something that he thinks can calm Tony, and he wants to show Volt it. Volt and Modius Samsara head off on their own. Plutonian, he tosses Carrie and Gilgamos aside, and Gilgamos slams down on the ground hard, and he is now out of the fight. Caden, she summons a ghost spirit, and has it start pummeling Plutonian. Carrie, who was tossed aside by Plutonian, prepares to return to the battle with him, but Cubit informs Carrie that millions of lives are at stake, he says, a tectonic shift about two miles down. You and Tony broke through a plate boundary and set off a seismic event. If you don't weld the fault back together again this second, it'll swallow entire cities. Harry, he doesn't want to deal with this right now. He's got to continue fighting Plutonian. But he doesn't want an earthquake that he potentially caused to be engulfing cities, so he relents. And he says, fine, he will fix it. Before he heads off, though, to fix the tectonic plates, he uses his energy beams to create some sort of construct to hold Plutonian down a bit and place something on Plutonian's head that blocks his vision. Cubit, he then goes over and discreetly talks to Orion, and he asks him, You have an invasion force right behind you, don't you? Orion admits, So, oh, Cubit, you know me too well. Don't tell Carrie, it'll spoil the surprise. See you soon. So it appears Cubit's suspicions of Orion were correct. Orion does have a demon invasion force waiting in the wings for Plutonian to be taken out of the picture, and then he will move in and be assumed take over the Earth. With Plutonian out of their way, they probably will not be able to be stopped. Elsewhere, Volt and Modius Samsara arrive at the edge of a cliff. Samsara claimed to Volt that he had something that would calm Plutonian down. Volt says, uh, I don't see anything. Modius Samsara reveals himself and says, You never could, you idiot. Volt is confused, and then he kind of figures it out and asks, Modius? That you? Modius Samsara replies, Mm-hmm. I have plans for Plutonian, you blockhead. But they require he and I to both live through all of this nonsense you've put into motion. You, on the other hand, you're expendable, Volt. Modius Samsara blindsides Volt and pushes him off the cliff, and Volt, he falls to his death. Bette Noir is aiming her gun at Plutonian, who is preoccupied by fighting Caden's spirits, and carries force fields that are restraining him, and Orion holding Plutonian down as well. Orion gets a little cocky and tells Plutonian, What's that phrase, Tony? Better the devil you know than the devil you don't? Too bad for your planet they all forgot that one. Bet Noir, she finally shoots that magic bullet at Plutonian. Now I want you all to imagine this next part is happening in slow motion, alright? Because a lot of stuff is going to go down in the brief amount of time it takes this bullet to get to its destination. So, the magic candle wax bullet is flying on its direct path towards Plutonian in the air. Cubit. He touches some electronic stuff on his watch device. And as the bullet is about to hit Plutonian, Cubit, he subtly opens a small teleportation portal right in front of the bullet's path. The bullet flies through the teleportation portal. Cubit, he then opens another portal where the bullet will exit from. And the bullet exits out of that portal and it flies directly into Orion's head, killing him. And Orion goes down. Now, this was a controversial decision that Cubit just made. He saved Plutonian's life because he felt that Plutonian could maybe come around. 
maybe be redeemed, maybe even do some good again. Whereas if they killed the Plutonian, Cubit thought that Orion would be an even bigger threat that perhaps they could not stop. Orion would bring in his army of demons. But did Cubit make the right choice in the end? That is hard to say. We will have to see the repercussions of this going forward. One thing is kind of clear though, the other members of the Paradigm are not going to be happy with Cubit's actions. Plutonian, he breaks free of the constraints that he was in, and he flies off as he hears Samsara asking for help. Carrie, he arrives back after welding the tectonic plates in the Earth back together again, and he sees that the demon Orion is dead, and he is outraged. He asks Cubit, Cubit, what have you done? Now we jump over to Plutonian, who flew away because he heard Modius Samsara's screams for help. So Plutonian, he flies over to Samsara, and Samsara explains why Volt is dead. He says, He tried to kill me, Tony! He tried, and, and then we fell, and then... And, and Plutonian tells Samsara, Shh! It's okay, pal, I'm here! Don't be scared! It's okay. Modius Samsara says, No, we, we have to leave here! I, I may be hurt, please! Tony, trust me, we have to get away from them, now! Plutonian and Modius Samsara, they fly off and retreat, away from everybody else. The rest of the Paradigm eventually arrive and see that Volt is indeed dead. Bette Noir looks at Cubit and asks him, How could you have stolen that from me? Bette Noir, she was feeling incredibly guilty because she didn't stop Plutonian earlier, and this was her chance to set things right and finally stop him now. And Cubit stole that from her and saved Plutonian instead. Bet Noir, she runs off. Carrie tells Cubit, let her run. She's finally free. She no longer has to carry the guilt of six million dead. You do. We had one chance at redemption, you son of a bitch, and now it's gone. Forever! You have anything you want to say for yourself? Cubit answers, No, not really. Although we see Cubit has secretly retrieved the magic candle wax bullet. Previously, when the bullet went through Orion's head, Cubit opened yet again another portal, and he used that portal to retrieve the candle wax bullet once more and he is planning on holding on to it for safekeeping, just in case he feels like they need to use it. But he is going to keep this secret from all the others. And this is the end of Volume 4. Alright, that was Volume 4 of Irredeemable. Let me go through some of my thoughts on this volume. I liked the Hornet origin story, I thought it was interesting, and because I've read this series, I know some interesting developments are going to be revealed with Hornet, which will really help recontextualize the origin story we read of him in this particular volume. I thought the Caden origin story was okay. I like that it did provide a little bit of an explanation for why she has the powers that she has, although I didn't think the story was that greatly executed. The second issue in this volume, the Bette Noir talking to her dad issue, I felt was a little bit filler, although it was interesting to meet some of the previous Paradigm members. I thought the final two issues in this volume were pretty exciting, though, especially the battle between Plutonian and the Paradigm. I thought it was really fascinating seeing Cubit have to make some difficult decisions. He decides to sort of betray the wishes of his team and take out this Orion character because he feels Orion is the greater threat, but the rest of his team is so focused on killing Plutonian that they are willing to give Orion a pass. So it's a very interesting dynamic between Cubit and the rest of his team in this volume that we saw explored. So I thought this volume was pretty good, although because of some of the 
kind of weaker issues in the beginning, I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments and who was right, Cubit or Carrie and the rest of the team that wanted to kill Plutonian or whatnot. And I will be back in the future with Volume 5, although, a reminder, I will be on vacation for the next two weeks, so I will be back with Volume 5 after that.